Hello, I'm Mary Burgess and I'm a Local Studies Assistant at the Cambridge Collection, the Local Studies Department of Cambridge Central Library. I'm going to be talking about Cambridge Women's Suffrage, the vote and beyond. This is not just the fight for the vote itself, but also the fight for women to be involved in every part of the life of Cambridge, both the town and the gown, concentrating on politics. 16th of October 1869 was the founding for the College for Women of Lenslow House in Hitchin by Emily Davies. The house is still there and is now a nursing home. They moved to Girton and reopened named after the village in October 1873. It was the first residential women's college offering degree level education and started with only five students. They firmly believed in women following the same courses in the same time scale as the men. This postcard of Girton College is from the 1900s. I particularly enjoy it as it actually shows women in the picture. 1871 was the founding of Newnham College. Henry Sidgwick rented a house, 74 Regent Street, for five women who wanted to attend lectures in Cambridge. They allowed women to study at their own level, starting below degree level if needed. Newnham is still a women-only college, along with New Hall, now called Murray Edwards, and for the time being, Lucy Cavendish. 11th of November 1884 was the first meeting of what later became the Cambridge Women's Suffrage Association in the Guildhall. It was inspired by the death of Henry Fawcett on the 6th, aged 51, only five days before. He died of pleurisy, which is infection of the lung lining. He is buried in Trumpeton Graveyard. Millicent Garrett Fawcett, his widow, was the first chair of the association and the records are held at Cambridgeshire Archives in Ely, collection 455. And this is Millicent Garrett Fawcett herself. This is a statue of her in Parliament Square by Gillian Wearing. It was unveiled on the 24th of April 2018 and is the first woman statue in Parliament Square. She campaigned on lots of different issues throughout her life but concentrated on women's suffrage. She also helped to found Newnham College. In 1886, the Cambridge Union Society debated this house is in favour of the extension of the parliamentary franchise to women. It had to be held over two sessions because the debates took so long. The final vote was held on Tuesday the 2nd of March. It went against women's suffrage with 59 supporting and 82 against. On 21st of May 1897, there was a University Senate House vote on degrees for women. It was not the first or the last vote, but it was probably the most famous. That's mostly because of this photograph of the effigy of the woman cyclist. It is hanging out of what is now the Cambridge University Press bookshop with Great St Mary's Church in the background. There was a previous vote ten years before and there will be more votes in the future as we will cover later. The result unsurprisingly went against the women with 1,707 votes to 661 against the women. The 1894 Local Government Act allowed all women to vote for parish councils, district councils, school boards and poor law guardians. Parish councils are the same as they are now, no change there. Most villages in Cambridge is a parish council. District councils are also the same, South Cambridgeshire is an example. School boards would now be known as boards of governors for a school, but their function remained similar. Poor law guardians have seen the most change, with poor law unions responsible for poor relief. They were run by boards of guardians and were mainly responsible for the workhouses in the area. The workhouse for Cambridge was on Mill Road, which is now Ditchburn Place. Chesterton had its own, which was later Chesterton Hospital. Any election women could vote in, they were also allowed to stand as candidates. They were not allowed to stand or vote in county or borough council elections until the 1907 Qualification of Women Act. This means they couldn't vote for the MP in that area or for councillors for wards in Cambridge. This is the Market Square in Cambridge on the 21st of November 1908. You can see St Edward King and Martyr Church in the background. This is the Cambridge Women's Suffrage Association with a petition. You can see that they describe themselves as constitutional here and they were suffragists, not suffragettes. They believed in campaigning in a legal way with Acts of Parliament. They were moderates, part of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, who were founded on the 14th of October 1897 as a joint union with Millicent Garrett Fawcett in the chair. Cambridge was a founder member. It was one of 15 founders who were mostly northern. Cambridge was the only society in East Anglia. Their colours were red, white and green, 
and they split up into sections covering the country. The numbers on the leaves show how many societies were in each section. Their counterpart, the suffragettes, were the Women's Social and Political Union, or WSPU. It was founded on the 10th of October 1903 by Emmeline Pankhurst. They're best known for green, white and purple and for breaking windows, being arrested and hunger striking. They were the militant group and thought that their cause needed direct action, not petitions. For the 1911 census, there is no proof of what they, they were up to in Cambridge, just a rather cryptic letter to the newspaper saying they would be happy to have another census when women had the vote, but in other places they either stayed up all night, out of doors, or didn't fill it in. This lady from Hampshire stuck a protesting leaflet on her census form. It is, however, very hard to prove a negative. Are they truly not on the census, or have you just not found them yet? On the 17th of May 1913, Miss Miriam Pratt, a schoolteacher from Norwich, set fire to a house in Storied Way. The house was empty as it was still being built. Suffragettes always made sure buildings were empty before arson. She was caught when her watch was discovered in the burnt building and identified by her uncle, a police sergeant. I have to say, if my uncle was a police sergeant, I might think twice about arson, but what do I know? Here she is on her way to court. She was sentenced to 18 months in prison in October. She went on hunger strike in Holloway Prison. She was released seven days later on the 1913 Prisoners' Temporary Decide for Ill Health Act, usually known as the Cat and Mouse Act. This allowed people to be released from prison to recover from their hunger strike and then be re-arrested and returned to prison later. Of course, many people absconded before being re-arrested and this is exactly what Miss Miriam Pratt did. She's not heard from again. Of course, the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies weren't staying still either. They decided to organise what they called a pilgrimage to London in 1913. They had many different routes, all converging on London for the Saturday the 26th of July from all over the country. They went to look like pilgrims of old with cockle shells on their hats and green, red and white rosettes. They often carried bags with the name of the route, Cambridge of the Great North Road. Here they are marching through Cambridge on the 17th of July 1913. They're heading down King's Parade with the Senate House on the right. The Cambridge Women's Suffrage Association banner is on the left just by the police officer on a horse. Many people cycled, some went by horse, others walked. You could drop in and out and they didn't expect you to do the whole route. Some people did walk all of it. One couple walked all the way from Cumbria. They often went with caravans to sleep in on the road and some places they were not offered a friendly reception. The Noonan and Girton students joined in as well. The alumni banner on the left and the town banner on the right. And this is the original banner in Noonan College. It was designed by Mary Lowndes and worked on by students of both Noonan and Girton. The central panel is in Cambridge blue silk with irises for Noonan and daisies for Girton. There is now a replica on display in both Girton and Noonan. And this is Millicent Fawcett talking to crowds in London on the 26th of July when they all met up in Hyde Park. There's law reviving suffragists on the sign. They wanted to separate themselves from the suffragettes. Large crowds attended with screeds written about it in both the local and the national press with full details about who was there, marches and speeches. Florence Ada Keynes was the first woman borough councillor, being elected for Fitzwilliam Ward unopposed in 1914 in a by-election. She also later became a Justice of the Peace in 1920 and the Mayor of Cambridge in 1932. She was responsible for the construction of the current Guild Hall. She was also mother of John Maynard Keynes, the famous economist. The First World War was declared on the 14th of August 1914. The suffragettes turn almost completely over to supporting the war effort, but the suffragists keep on with the fight. Lots of women end up working in occupations formerly taken only by men. This includes cleaning windows and shuffling coke at the gasworks, along with being employed as road sweepers by the corporation. This was hard, heavy, dirty work outdoors and often in nasty conditions. It was also the first time a woman was employed by Cambridge City Library. Here are some known suffragettes. On the left is Elsie Bowerman and on the right is Lillian Clark selling flags to soldiers to support Prisoner of War Day on the 19th of March 1916. The Representation of the People Act was finally signed into law on the 6th of February 1918. Roughly 40% of all women were enfranchised by this act. Only women over 30 who were householders, married to householders, or rented unfurnished property worth more than £5. Women graduates could also vote for the university MPs, but not in Cambridge as women still didn't have degrees. 
On the 23rd of August 1920, the first Women Justices of the Peace were appointed. Here's the first five being signed in and hearing their first cases. The lady standing on the left is Leah Manning, who was a teacher in Cambridge and the first woman president of the Cambridge Labour Party. She later became a Labour MP for Islington East. The 1921 Degrees for Women vote saw male undergrads racing to Newnham College to bust the gates in with a handcart. University women were now allowed to gain the much joked about BA TIT, a titular diploma issued by the local examination syndicate, but not the full degree. Oxford gave women degrees the year before in 1920. The first woman mayor for Cambridge was Eva Hartree, who served from 1924 to 1925. Here she is in her formal robes. She was a liberal who also helped with the German and Spanish refugees. The 1928 Equal Franchise Act was signed into law on the 2nd of July, with the first elections on it in December. It finally gave the same voting rights to men and women, with both being able to vote at the age of 21. Lillian Mary Hart Clark was the first woman head of a council outside London. She took over Cambridgeshire County Council in 1947. She was the governor of what is now Anglo Ruskin University for 35 years. And here she is on the board in Shah Hall. You can also see Clara Dorothy Rackham, who is a leading Labour Party politician in Cambridge. During the general strike of 1926, the Cambridge strike headquarters was in her kitchen. It wasn't until 1948 women were allowed to be full graduates of Cambridge University. Cambridge was the last university in the country to allow women this right. The first woman so honoured was Queen Elizabeth, better known now as the Queen Mother, on the 22nd of October 1948. Cambridge had to wait until 1992 to get her first and so far only woman MP. Anne Campbell elected for Labour on Thursday the 9th of April 1992. The Cambridgeshire Collection was founded in 1855 and collects the history of Cambridge and Cambridgeshire. We're based on the third floor of Cambridge Central Library and we are free to access and open to all. We have over 60,000 books, over 80,000 illustrations and photographs, printed maps from Cambridgeshire from 1574 over 90 local newspaper titles, newspaper cuttings on 1,500 different subjects for the last 50 years and much, much more. We also have a wide variety of sources for women's suffrage in Cambridgeshire. Many of the portrait photographs in this talk are part of the Palmer Clark negative collection with over 900 boxes of glass negative photographs of the people of Cambridge. We have printed books on the subject and lots of newspapers, both on microfilm and in the original newsprint. Many of them have been digitised on the British Newspaper Archive website for easier searching. Thanks for watching. In partnership with Cambridge Libraries, the exhibition Unfinished Business is opening in Cambridge at the Lion Yard Shopping Centre on the 23rd of October 2020. This exhibition shines a light on some of the extraordinary women and the campaigns that have paved the way. Inspired by the British Library exhibition, also called Unfinished Business, this pop-up exhibition explores how feminist activism in the UK has its roots in the complex history of women's rights. This pop-up exhibition is also opening simultaneously at 25 libraries across the UK, giving you the chance to get a taste of unfinished business in your community. Discover this exhibition from 23rd of October until the 10th of December at the Lion Yard Shopping Centre, and find out more ways to get involved by visiting the British Library website.